Archie Cochrane was the only doctor in a prisoner of war camp during World War II. One night, the Germans dumped a young Soviet prisoner on the ward. The soldier was badly wounded, screaming, had a hole in his lungs. The geek word for that is pleurisy. Cochrane didn't want to wake up the other prisoners, so brought him into a private room. He didn't speak any Russian, didn't know anyone who did, had no morphine, just aspirin, which wasn't working. Eventually, Cochrane instinctively sat down on the bed beside the prisoner, held him in his arms, and the screaming stopped almost at once. The Soviet prisoner died peacefully a few hours later. It wasn't the pleurisy which caused the screaming, it was loneliness. Cochrane reports keeping the story secret due to what he calls a misdiagnosis. Now, what if he had had morphine? Would that have helped the soldier? Or would it have been a waste of resources? So what Cochrane did was he instinctively understood what was needed and did something about it. That's what empathy is, shared understanding and acting on it. There are three things about Cochrane's story I'm going to follow up on. One, without empathy, you can't make the right diagnosis. Two, sometimes lack of empathy can harm. And three, sometimes all patients need is a dose of empathy. More recently, a doctor friend of mine called Anne, that's not her real name, was teaching three very bright young medical students in their final year. Their task was to, to diagnose a woman complaining of severe shoulder pain in her left shoulder. The students followed all the guidelines, took notes. In the end, there were seven pages of notes, and then prescribed two drugs, an anti-inflammatory and a painkiller. Anne agreed that all they did was evidence-based, but something told her there was more to the story. She sat down beside the patient and began talking. Soon the patient began crying about a family tragedy. After a few more minutes of talking, comforting, the crying and the shoulder pain vanished. So what if they had prescribed painkillers? Well, we've all heard of the opioid crisis, which kills more people than heroin and cocaine combined every year in the US. Because there's some evidence that even routine painkillers lead people on the wrong path. More and more, stronger and stronger painkillers, destruction, and then for some, death. On the other hand, for other patients, the painkillers can be a, a bridge to hell, help them get over a hump, lead normal lives again. Now, how could a doctor make the right diagnosis? Will this painkiller lead them on a path to destruction, or will it be a bridge to hell? Well, nobody will get it right all the time, but having empathy and understanding will help them get it right more often than if they don't have it. This is a true story about a middle-aged smoker who died of smoking-related heart disease. Her sister kept on telling her that she must go visit the doctor, but she refused, saying, no, whenever I go there, all they do is talk about my smoking. Her previous experience with the healthcare profession was negative. They were judgmental, they lacked understanding, they lacked empathy. Now, what if she had seen the doctor? Would she have lived longer? The people I know who wrote the paper about her said yes, that lack of empathy contributed to her death. So lack of empathy can harm. These stories are nice, you might say, but if you're a skeptic, you'll ask for evidence. Is empathy evidence-based? And in fact, a guy called Bruce Thomas took up my late friend and colleague, George Lewis, on just this very point. He said, George, you're always very empathic and positive with your patients, because being positive, as long as you don't lie, is part of empathy. You can't be empathic without being positive and vice versa. So he said, George, this might brighten up the room in some non-specific way when you're empathic and positive, but it doesn't actually help your patients get better. George said, Bruce, why don't you test that in a trial? Bruce said, yes, I'll do it, and I'll finally prove that you're mistaken. So what did Bruce do? He took a bunch of cards, wrote positive on some and negative on the other half, shoveled them up, put them in his drawer. When patients would come in, He'd first make sure nothing very serious was, was wrong. If they needed to call an ambulance, he would do so, obviously. But most consultations in family practice and general practice aren't that serious, thankfully. In those cases, he'd open his drawer, pull out a card. If the card was positive and they needed a drug, he would say, this treatment is going to help you, almost certainly. Give me a call in three weeks to make sure everything's OK. If they didn't need, need a drug, he would say, you don't need any treatment. You're going to get better on your own. Come back in three weeks and we'll check up. On the other hand, if the card said negative, he'd be his usual grumpy self. 
He would say, I'm not quite sure if this treatment worked, if you needed a treatment. Um, you might not get better. I'm not sure what's, ha what's happening. Let's have another appointment. So in both cases, he was telling the truth. But in one case, he was focusing on the half full part of the glass. In the other, other treatments, he was focusing on the half empty part of the glass. How we communicate this truth affects the health of our patients. You still might say, Jeremy, you're cherry picking that study. It's about your friend. And cherry picking is not good. We have to avoid it. The way we avoid cherry picking, doing these massive mega studies, systematic re reviews, which you, you've heard of, I'm sure. So with an international team of researchers, we did that. We trolled through six databases, over 40,000 titles, checked, double checked, triple checked all the data. In the end, we found 28 trials with over 6,000 patients. <coughs> trials of things like what Bruce Thomas did, where doctors were encouraged, sometimes trained, to be extra empathic or extra positive, compared with doctors who carried on as usual. And as usual, for some of them means very empathic. Others, they're not so empathic. They're more, more like Bruce. And even those who are naturally empathic, they're often under severe time pressure and under management pr pressure to complete forms, stare at the computer screen. And 26 of those 28 studies showed a positive benefit. Empathic, positive communication improved things from length of stay in hospital and lung function to pain, patient satisfaction, and quality of life without side effects. The only side effect was positive. It reduced anxiety. So like any study, ours had some limitations. The trials were all smallish, and it's impossible to blind. Doctors know if they are being encouraged to give more empathy or be more positive. Still, the effects we found suggest that a dose of empathy can be better than drugs for some common things. because. Over-the-counter drugs, like aspirin and ibuprofen, barely outperform placebo in these large studies. For many common things, including most chronic pain, most cancer pain, and most back pain, yet these drugs do have side effects. So a dose of empathy is all many patients need who have mild pain, mild depression, mild anxiety, and even if they do need a drug or some other treatment, adding a dose of empathy is likely to boost the effects. We're understanding more and more about how empathy works. First of all, without empathy, you can't make the right diagnosis. In the most extreme case, like the smoker we just talked about, the patient won't even show up for you to make the diagnosis. Second of all, an empathic practitioner helps to put patients at ease, helps them to relax. And lower to anxiety has been shown in numerous studies to reduce pain and depression. Thirdly, by giving a positive message to a patient, this activates their brain in a way that causes their bodies to produce their own pain-killing endorphins. Endorphin, as you know, just means morphine produced by your body. Importantly, as I come to a close of this talk, it's not just doctors like George and Anne who can use the healing power of empathy. You can use it too. So how many of you have helped a friend or family member, or even a stranger in some time of need. Put up your hand. So everybody, what you might not know is you probably improved their health because many, many studies show connections with people, friends, family members, social groups, extend life by on average five years. And how about ourselves? Are we empathic enough with ourselves? How many of you have allowed negative, unconstructive thought patterns to ruminate in your brain for longer than they need to be there. Put up your hand. Everybody. Well, again, studies show that these negative thought patterns are bad for our mental health. So the next time you're about to beat yourself up for not being perfect, just give yourself an empathic pat in the back and move on to deal with it in a constructive way. So the healing power of empathy is real. It's also evidence-based. Let's all use it to benefit ourselves and others. Thank you very much.